Okay, monitoring is paying close attention to identify factors that contribute to weed, pests, and disease problems. And as you are probably learning, these are all interchangeable. Weeds provide homes for pests. Pests provide diseases to um, plants, etc. So it's important to be monitoring all of these things. So monitoring tools include hand lenses or loops, magnifiers, traps, pheromones, sticky, etc. Beating trays, I've got a video on that. Sweeping nets, I've got a video on that. Forecasting models, uh, there's a great one under resources from Oregon State where you can actually uh, determine the closest weather station to where you are. And so you can look at diseases and insects there. And leaf wetness sensors, sometimes you'll see information on this. It's not a, a good source of monitoring. I'm just putting it on there. Um, potato slices can be used to monitor for fungus gnats. So general guidelines include monitoring early. You want to look at your new plants and cuttings. Of course, quarantine any new plants. Set your threshold. Determine your infestation levels. So you're going to be looking at sticky traps, potato slices, etc. cetera. Um, you can randomly pick up plants to take a look, usually on the underside of the leaves. You can use white paper under the plant and just kind of shake the leaves and things like thrips will fall to that white paper. They're very tiny so that's probably the easiest way to find them. Look for signs and symptoms. You want to keep detailed records and you want to treat preventatively like with barriers or beneficial insects or etc. IPM doesn't necessarily use pesticides as the first resort so this is more mechanical and biological we're talking about. So I wanted to talk about a specific things here. Um, your book and some of the things I've provided will talk about general guidelines for monitoring, but I wanted to talk about particular things here. So thrips in the greenhouse, a huge problem. Several species cause problems, probably the worst of which is western flower thrips. It's important to know their life cycle so you know when to be monitoring and uh, this will tell you how long in a particular temperature 68 to 98 which is quite often in a greenhouse in that range how long it takes to get to these different stages. So why do we care about thrips? Well thrips spread viruses so here are the genera of viruses that are spread by um, thrips we got TOSPO viruses. These are impatiens, necrotic spot virus, and tomato spotted wilt virus. And I would like you to realize that these names are not necessarily going to indicate specific plants they're going to attack, especially impatiens, necrotic spot virus attacks many plants not even closely related to impatiens. Illavirus would be blueberry shock in our area. Carmovirus, Pelargonium flower break carmovirus, Soba movirus, uh, this is southern bean mosaic virus. Again, this is don't let the name fool you. This can attack other types of plants. And Maclomovirus are maize chlorotic model virus. So monitoring for thrips, first of all, um, you can see here some damage in the left here. This is on a bean leaf. They have rasping, sucking mouth parts. So they are actually sucking juices as they're tearing tissue. And sometimes you'll get a silvery appearance of the leaves. You have the life cycle you need to think about. And uh, on the top here, we've got a western flower thrips with wings. This is an adult. Um, below that is uh, another type of thrips and you can see they are very tiny and these are the different stages. They're nymphs. They have uh, gradual metamorphosis or simple metamorphosis so they don't really change a whole bunch. The adults often have wings. That's really the big difference. And then the way to monitor for thrips, the best way to monitor is blue with blue sticky cards. And you can use yellow, but blue is better for thrips. 
You do want to be careful about wearing light colored clothing, uh, especially white, yellow, or blue, because they are attracted to that color. They may land on your clothing and you can spread them to other plants. Okay, spruce aphids are a real problem in our area and mostly on blue spruce, Colorado blue spruce in particular in the Seattle area, but they can affect Sitka spruce, Norway spruce, and other spruce species. Um, they're very tiny, they're about 16th of an inch, and you can kind of see the damage. You can see how tiny they are on the needles here. And here's some of the damage you might see. These, uh, the bottom left is Sitka spruce, and you can see many trees have been killed by this pest. On the right, it's also a Sitka spruce. In the middle, that's probably a Colorado blue spruce. This is very commonly seen in the Seattle area. So the big problem here is that they feed in the winter and early spring, usually February. By the time you see the damage, they're already gone usually. You may see a big increase in March into April. If you have important trees in the landscape, say you've got a specimen tree, in your customer's landscape, you wanna start looking weekly in November. Um, if it's something that's just out in the woods somewhere that you're not that concerned about, you can start looking at it in February. Weather can also affect populations. If you've got prolonged cool temperatures or spring frost, that can reduce populations. And one of the biggest problems with this thing is that there are no beneficial insects available in February. It's too cold. so. You may have to use pesticides and some of the oils are recommended for this. However, it will cause damage to the blue color on the Colorado blue spruce. So think about it before you apply it. Okay, apple scab is a big problem on the west side of the mountains. You can see on the far right here, this is what the apples look like and they have kind of a corky texture. So um, these might be good for cider, but they're not going to be very good for edible um, for eating them and so in the middle here you've got these olive colored spots and then if you turn on the underside of the leaf you're going to see the uh, fruiting bodies on the underside of the leaf and that's actually on a crab apple so it's not just apples it's on crab apples as well so you get black lesions early in the spring you want to look at the veins petioles and leaf tissue um, if you've got an orchard. You're going to look at probably 10 trees. You want to look for 20 leaves on five limbs and then follow a W pattern, sort of like we did with soils and you're doing your soil sample, follow a W so it's random. You also want to look at branches that are closer to the ground. They're more, more likely to be infected by overwintering spores. Um, it does overwinter on apples that have fallen to the ground. It can germinate and grow within a few hours on an apple, apple or crab apple t tissue. So really important for sanitation. That's a big part of management on this thing. So you want to look at areas that have been previously infected. Once the fruit is set, you want to keep an eye on it and scab is most likely to occur near the calyx first. Sometimes you won't see the late season infections until you start to store these things. Apples most susceptible include Red Delicious, Rome Beauty, Jonathan, Wine Sap, Gra Granny Smith, Gala, Summered, and Jersey Mac. Crab apples are also susceptible. Okay, so weeds are really important to be managed in and around greenhouses, certainly in a landscape, but in the greenhouse situation, it's so important. And I just wanted to focus on a couple of weeds here. We've got common chickweed on the left and hairy bittercress on the right. These are winter annual weeds and so that is so important for you to be able to see what they look like early. So if you remember I mentioned that impatiens necrotic spot virus uh, does not necessarily just occur on impatiens. If you look in the upper right corner, that's actually hardy geranium that has this virus. And then we've got tomato spotted wilt virus on balloon flower on the bottom here. So it's not just tomatoes.
So they're winter annuals, so they're going to start shooting up in the fall, but uh, quite often you don't even know they're there until the spring when you see this lovely spot. And uh, the one on the left, Harry Britocress, is also known as shotweed because when you go to pull them, they're going to shoot seeds all over, and they actually hurt when they hit your face. I've had that happen several times. Um, here's cop and chick chickweed on the right. Both of these flower and seed at the same time. So chances are if you see the flowers, it's already too late. They're already going to seed. So it's much better to manage them early. This is what you're going to see in the fall. So keep your eyes open. Do a fall cleanup around your greenhouse. And uh, actually keep an eye out for weeds in any container plants you're getting. But anyway, on the left here is Harry Bittercress hairy bittercress and on the right common chickweed. This is what they look like in the fall and the chickweed doesn't look like much but the thing about chickweed is it's in the caryophyllaceae so it's got opposite leaves and swollen nodes so that is one indicator that's what you have. Um, they are edible but I would suggest if you're around the greenhouse don't let them go just because you want to eat them. You want to make sure you're not harboring insects and diseases.